Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. It's hosted by the LIMS Forum. My name is Dinah Ramirez and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Today's webinar, A Guide for Laboratory Systems Management, is part four of a webinar series that's been presented by Joe Laskowski. Today we'll be focusing on LIMS, ELNs, SDMSs, IT, and education. If you're joining us for the first time in the series, Joe is an experienced laboratory automation computing professional with over 40 years experience in the field, including the design and development of automation systems, LIMS, robotics, and data interchange standards, and consults on the use of computing in lab work. So we're very excited to have Joe with us here again for part four in his series. So let's check in with Joe and we'll get started. All right, Joe, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, and thanks for the introduction. Welcome to the fourth session in this series. We'll be continuing to look at the factors in making a choice of central database systems, the added concerns that multi-laboratory environments can bring, and the role that information technology support groups have in this process. As we've noted in these webinars, this companion book will provide useful background information on the technologies, support, and other factors that can impact your ability to effectively use these systems. It should prove to be a useful reference as the webinars get into more technical details. Those details will become more apparent in this session, and I'll be making reference to sections of the book for more information. I'll also provide additional reference material at the end of the webinar. The previous sessions have introduced the major systems in laboratory informatics and how the return on investment can be measured and evaluated. In the last session, webinar three, we began looking at the points that need to be considered when choosing between a LIMS, ELN, or SDMS for a single lab plus the documentation needed to support those decision, decisions. At this point, we're assuming that you've addressed the issue of what type of central database system you're going to use as a target, whether it's a LIMS, ELN, SDMS, or some combination of them. At this point, we aren't looking at specific products, but rather product characteristics that fit, that fit your workflow whether it be large-scale repetitive testing or laboratory work diary. Our initial focus on the central database system as a starting point is based on a simple premise. Multiple uncoordinated workflows from isolated workstations will leave you with multiple sources of data and information that will at some point have to be integrated. Without that integration, Comprehensive lab-wide or even technique-wide data analysis and evaluation will suffer significantly. You're better off addressing this need as early as you can in your lab's life. We looked at these points with regard to a single laboratory. And now we're going to consider the points that might arise in a multi-laboratory environment. Different implementation structures, and the role of IT support in this work. Multiple lab situations can arise for a number of reasons. You may be working at a research complex or for a company or organization that has multiple campuses. One laboratory may do testing in support of research and also develop test methods that we put to use in quality control labs. The questions that we want to address are, can multiple labs benefit from common product usage and can they agree on one or more product characteristics that can lead them to successfully choosing and implementing working systems? The benefits of focusing on a single product or small set of products include reduced purchase costs. Some informatic systems permit multiple independent You have the ability to support several labs with a single license. If you're buying software for several labs, you've got better targeting power. The other benefits derive from support costs. If the number of sites you're working with is large enough, the vendor may offer special support considerations. If your IT group is supporting your software, 
they will have an easier time supporting one product set, particularly if it involves development work. In addition, the learning curve for lab personnel will be smoother, and if people transfer between departments, they will have access to systems that they're already familiar with. Similarly, meeting the needs of regulatory compliance will be simplified. All of this works if you don't have to compromise on meeting your laboratory's needs. You don't want to have to sacrifice important features or force fit limbs functionality into an ELN. However, products that support both workflows would be useful, particularly if needs evolve from one way or another. When we're dealing with systems like these, there are additional considerations that have to be taken into account. Among them are systems backup and archives. Both are designed to address an important problem, data loss and retrieval. Everything we've covered so far has been concerned with getting data and information. It has to be protected from loss as well. Systems crash, there are floods, storms, electrical failures, and now we're to take into account. Protection against data loss includes backups and archives. Backup provides short-term insurance against system failure and data loss. They are copies, essentially a snapshot of the entire system or major segments of it depending on your policies. Different portions of the system may be backed up at different frequencies. A backup can be used to restore all or part of a system. Archives are another form of backup and will include both actively used documents and historical information organized so that it's easily searched and has the ability to retrieve the contents, including older versions of the documents. Those have to be backed up as well. This is a subject that could warrant a session on its own. I've mentioned it here because of the impact of these activities on IT support and how that can be affected by the choices made in both product selection and use by multiple laboratories. In case you're wondering, I have my work backed up or archived three different ways, including remote archives. The backup is a current snapshot of the disk drives on the system. The archives contain historical information, including current and older versions of files. A little paranoia goes a long way. Why is this important to you? The shift from paper-based systems to electronic media offers something you didn't have before. Protection against loss of laboratory work, plus the ability to easily reorganize it and distribute it for use elsewhere. It also raises a concern that you didn't have before. Security against electronic theft and malicious behavior including ransomware and other problems. We're beginning to define the roles of an outside organization in laboratory work, that of IT support. One important characteristic of LIMS and ELMs designed for laboratory work is the ability to connect instruments and data systems either directly to the database system or through an intermediate system like an SDMS. This is an important selling point for these systems and a key component of improving productivity and return on investment. Instrument data can be automatically entered into the database and work lists can be sent from the data system to instrument experimental workstations. How significant these points are and how they fit into your needs is going to be a consideration in the next few slides. What we will be covering will have a direct bearing on multi-lab system support and suitability. How data and information are collected and moved around the laboratory between data sources and destinations will have some bearing on how you prepare for centralized database systems and where they're located. The three primary modes of collection and communications are shown on the screen. Analog data capture with digital controls, serial communications, and Ethernet compliant systems. These can range from instrument computer combinations that are one-to-one -one or many instruments to one computer, to devices with built-in communications protocols and connectors. We'll look at the implications of a centralized database system in the next few slides. The output of an analog device can go to a meter, chart recorder, or most commonly today, a computer system. The instrument, the data source, 
has to be closed to the computer to avoid cabling problems, as well as noise elimination. Normally, the computer will provide instrument control, including an audit sampler, via digital switches through a digital I.O. card. The computer provides the analysis of the data with reporting and communications, usually via Ethernet or Wi-Fi, to an SDMS, LIMS, Laboratory Information System, or ELN. The distance between the instrument computer workstation and the instrument is dependent upon the nature of the control and data signals, the acquisition speed, and the options for data conversion over intermediate network devices. High-speed data collection and the use of hyphenated techniques argue for close proximity to facilitate acquisition and control. Low-speed devices, such as chromatographs, would permit longer separations, particularly if care were taken for noise rejection and cabling. Since the computer provides data storage and communications buffering, the proximity of the computer to the centralized data system isn't a problem as long as provision for fault tolerance to the loss of network connections is built in. This becomes more of an issue as database computers become more physically distant from the instrument system due to the potential for delays and downtime. The loss of a connection will impact information transfer in both directions. Test results one way, work lists in the other. Some common laboratory devices are really packages of measuring instruments and computer control systems. The instrument provides the analog signal and the computer converts it into digital form and provides serial or ethernet communications protocols to a computer system. pH meters and balances are among the devices that fall into this type of instrumentation. These devices are usually designed to work in two possible modes, front panel controls operated by a person and programmable modes that depend on instructions from computers. Front panel operations are controlled by the analyst's needs. Take a measurement, transmit it, and so on. The back panel command structure is a simple command and reply sequence. For example, a balance may be told to record a weight and send it back to a computer. This requires an active connection. If there's a delay or either the instrument or computer goes offline, nothing happens. LIMS, electronic laboratory notebooks, and laboratory execution systems usually have facilities to connect these devices to a computer and controlling them. A laboratory execution system, for example, may interact with the balance by instructing the analyst to place something on the balance pan, press a button, and then the software records the weight in its data set, ready to be used in the next step of the process. LIMS and ELNs have similar functions. If the connection between the software system and device drops out, nothing will happen, and the analyst will have to revert to manual front panel operations, entering the information into a database later. When we talk about connecting instruments to centralized database systems, we aren't talking about the analog or digital interfaces. What we're looking at is communications between computer systems, exchanging files or serial data. Even in those cases, serial communications is best done with the use of a local to the lab intermediate computer. Connecting instruments really means connecting the computer systems that are attached to instruments and transferring files, or if data exchange standards are in place, exchanging messages. The problem with serial data is twofold. First, there's a lack of an error-free communications protocol with error detection and correction. And second, considering the previous examples, there's a possibility of delays in transmission, resulting in problems carrying out lab tasks. It's easier to let a local computer handle the instrument responses and package the result, resulting information in a file transmitted over networks. Fundamentally, time-critical, fast response tasks should be serviced by a local-to-the-lab computer. This is part of the planning needed in laying out lab networks. When files are transmitted by instrument workstations to a LIMS, ELN, lab execution system, or SDMS, they are received and analyzed to extract the necessary information. The information is then entered into the database system. The words interfacing and communications are not synonymous. 
They represent different technologies, and we have to be careful how they're applied to laboratory work. It's important to understand the distinction between the instrument and the data system. We don't normally interface instruments to LIMS or ELNs. The interfacing is done through a computer system that communicates to the LIMS or ELN. We'll go on to instrument interfacing and data systems in more detail in a later session. It's very important to the design of your lab's technology. The need for a distinction between interfacing and communications will begin to become clear in the next few slides. This is a simple situation. One lab, one system. With the arrangement the lab has, with this arrangement, the lab has complete flexibility in connecting instrumentation to the LIMS or ELN, as well as configuring the database to meet its needs. If specialized programming is needed to support an instrument, the lab has the freedom to do so. All of the instrument types in the previous slides could be supported. One consideration in particular is worth noting. Commercial data systems have a library of software available to support instrumentation and make instrument computer connections easier. What happens if your device isn't supported? If it's a low cost device, it might be far easier and less costly to replace it with one that is. If not, find something similar and modify the software. Otherwise, you have an add-on project. Instrument support requirements should be part of the user requirements. Software modifications are an IT issue. Until the advent of high-speed networks, this was a typical laboratory system configuration. IT would be responsible for the hardware setup, the operating systems, and infrastructure, as well as system backup. The support for lab application software might come from corporate IT, but also might be a lab function or else contracted to a third party. The multiple lab variation excuse me, is just a repeat configuration for each lab. With this arrangement, the labs retain complete flexibility in connecting instruments to the LIMS or ELN, as well as configuring the database to meet their needs. If specialized programming is needed to support it in an instrument, the lab has the freedom to do so. If different labs have similar interconnection needs, the development work done for one laboratory can be repeated elsewhere. This is one clear benefit of standardizing on product sets as long as it doesn't compromise the lab's work. This situation can be replicated for a number of labs based on the same products, each lab laboratory having full independence. IT support would have to manage multiple computer systems dealing with support, updates, and so on. Each system would be individually backed up and the data systems archived. As noted earlier, this could be done automatically. This puts a considerable, considerable burden on IT staff, which could be mitigated by automatic backup procedures. Backup and archive facilities would have to be incorporated into the user requirements, along with the policies for frequency and archiving of backups. There would also have to be periodic testing of backups and archives to make sure that the process is working. The next variation provides support benefits, but starts putting some complexity into the system. In this arrangement, we have three independent labs sharing access to common LIMS installations, or it could be an ELN or a multifunctional system, with each lab having its own copy of a database, Note, not all vendors support this configuration. This could be considered as a variation on the software as a service model, with the software hosted on a private corporate server instead of the vendors. Another variation is the use of virtualization. Virtualization is a software technology that allows one or more servers to host multiple copies of software running independently. There are some benefits and limitations that are imposed on the lab. The SDMS configured is configured to be local to the lab in order to facilitate tasks that need fast responses. There are multiple configurations possible with these systems, and you have to evaluate your needs to determine the one most appropriate for your work. From the lab standpoint, they have access to a fully functionalized central database system, again, whether it's LIMS or ELN. 
Laboratory data is concentrated in the SDMS with necessary information passed through the central database system. The SDMS acts as a buffer or primary storage for laboratory instrument data. The centralized data system would not be modified to meet individual labs' needs. This is necessary to ensure that the data systems are easily upgraded and supported without having to re-implement custom modifications. Those modifications would be implemented in the SDMS, which is supported by each laboratory's independent configuration. The major benefits are in the cost of the systems when compared to purchasing and installing multiple independent systems. The cost reduction for support and maintenance, easier, the, making it easier to add additional labs, and the ease of providing backup and archiving. Security and physical access is controlled, control is provided by the IT staff. One popular technology application is moving software and data systems to the cloud. From a network topology standpoint, this configuration and that of the previous slide are pretty much the same. A list of benefits from cloud implementations, particularly, particularly those that are vendor supported, are considerable. However, the issues do need attention. One of the obvious points is that the server for the database isn't anywhere you're likely to be able to visit and that raises some issues of its own. While we're used to having the web take us virtually anywhere in the world with a few clicks and having the results pop up quickly, we can enter information into systems without having any idea where they are and expect good response times. Networks are fast enough that we are able to distinguish between the response time for areas with well-developed networks and those with less sophisticated systems. Right now, we're experiencing an example of these network capabilities. I'm in Massachusetts, our producer is in Michigan, and you guys are all over the place. The distance between client and server systems can be measured in two ways. The time it takes to send and receive data and information, and the physical separation between them. In most cases, the physical separation doesn't matter. But the point-to-point -point physical span can have a significant impact on performance when life is less than ideal. When we are planning in the planning process, we have to work against potential problems, including the security of your intellectual property. When the servers move off campus, distance concerns increase and new ones are added. Those are security, downtime, delays, and legal issues. Geographically distributed networks raise some issues. The most obvious are the delays and interruptions, the 404 or file not found errors or delayed email messages. They aren't frequent, but they happen. Planning for them is essential. Even situations like the one we're experiencing can have problems that need to be planned for. And I hope I didn't just jinx it. For example, we, are, we have rehearsal recordings that we can use if something prevented a live presentation. The problem for your lab is, what happens if your connection to your LIMS or ELN is lost? What are the vendor's backup plans? Do they have redundant systems that you can switch to if there's a problem? How often are they synchronized? Do you know, do you know how to access them? Have you tested that process? The further away you are from the server, the more room they have for problems to occur. Among the causes for problems are power outages, storms like the large hurricanes experienced in the U.S. and elsewhere, and the potential for earthquakes. You may feel that you're in a safe area, but how about your vendor service, servers and the space in between? These aren't reasons to avoid using the technologies that are available, but areas where planning has to be done, including testing, running the equivalent of fire drills to make sure that the plans actually work. This is a subject where your IT group's experience, in conjunction with your vendors, come into play. The time to make these plans is before implementation has begun. In fact, before you even sign anything. Another concern is, is security. The networks we, we rely on are global in extent. So are the people who would like to have access to your data and information. 
Are your corporate and remote systems protected against attacks that can include unauthorized access, malware, denial of services, ransomware, and other unpleasant issues? The typical SaaS vendor will say that their security is better than your corporate systems. This is another area where your IT group can work with your prospective vendors to ensure functioning and safe systems. The last point I want to make on this subject is legal issues. When you're using software hosted on third-party platforms, you become subject to a number of legal issues that may originate in your location, country, or the country where your servers are located. For example, you may be working with a software as a service vendor for a database and they host it on a subcontractor server farm that has locations in your country or another. Each of these can contribute to legal concerns and you may not have done anything wrong. Vendors may offer the option of hosting your database and software either on a private server or a shared system. If you're on a shared system and someone else does something bad, the entire server may be impounded, including your data. The laws on this subject can vary widely by country, and it's an evolving issue. This is one where both IT and your legal department may need to be included because before finalizing the relationships with the SaaS vendor. We began this presentation looking at the options for lab informatics with all systems residing within, within the lab's walls and then considered the possibility of reducing costs by several labs using the same products. That depends on individuals' labs, labs needs analysis converging down to compatible solutions. That being the case, we then looked at the ramifications of consolidating systems into shared on-site servers and then having those databases hosted off-site by third-party vendors, the software as a service model. We also looked at how instrument interfacing, data systems, and communications affected the distribution of informatics inside the lab and working with remote systems. In a previous webinar, we made a statement that even startup labs need to focus on the centralized database as one of their initial priorities, determining if they need a LIMS or ELM, for example, to support their lab's information capture and analysis. Vendor-supported software as a service models may be a good way to implement these tools while minim minimizing the financial investment. In all of this, we made frequent reference to the role of IT support. Now is the time to begin looking at that subject in more detail. We first raised the information technology support issue in webinar three when we discuss needs development. Now as we start looking at implementation and support options, particularly when the central database system uh, might migrate from the lab to on-campus hosting and then off-site, off possibly by third-party support, the need for coordination with IT becomes important. There are shared responsibilities between lab personnel and IT support for the successful use of informatic systems in the lab. As we've discussed, the lab user community is responsible for determining what is needed and how it should function. They have to be intimately involved in product specification and selection, as well as evaluating the implementation options and the final system. This stuff directly impacts their ability to work and the validity of laboratory processes being executed. So what exactly should the role of IT be? They aren't just people who support hardware and software. They need to be advisors on software issues and in particular support. That includes their ability to support users and their evaluations of a vendor's ability to support products and ensure that they're working properly. This world is a lot more complex than office products and people have, need to have the right balance of skills to be successful. Your laboratory depends on it. We need to consider the role of corporate IT and the possible addition of a lab IT function. In most organizations, corporate IT is responsible for hardware support, operating systems, and frequently used application software, office applications, for example, as well as corporate database systems, and in many companies, enterprise resource planning systems and help desk support. 
Enterprise resource planning includes a number of functions that run the businesses, including customer service, human resources, accounting, production, sales, and so on. These are large, expensive systems that can encompass an entire business operation. We'll get to how that impacts your lab later, probably in the next webinar. While the capabilities provided by corporate IT are important to the lab's operation, fully su supporting laboratories is usually a bit outside their experience. The items on the left are what companies typically see as a description of IT support. Organizations that support manufacturing and scientific work may be able to justify personnel that are specialized in those fields. In some cases, you may have people holding advanced scientific or engineering degrees providing an IT support function. The items on the right are more typical of laboratory systems. The first bullet, for example, might be at odds with corporate policies of upgrading operating systems. In a lab, an upgrade could be a disaster. There are a large number of lab applications found in any facility, which is a significant contrast to most business operations. Vendors and lab systems can skimp on documentation. They're more interested in technical aspects of their products than they are in effective user documentation and support. The impact of system problems can be serious. Problems can easily snowball as work needs gets backed up. And finally, it's really hard to find people with the skills needed to support lab work. It isn't just technical know-how, it's people skills, troubleshooting, and problem solving, with a wee bit of pressure rated just to keep it interesting. What we need to do is develop professionals with a balance of skills to meet the increasingly complex demands of technology management and scientific and laboratory work. At one time, that might have meant understanding LIMS or ELNs or robots or instrument interfacing. Now it's a complex and specialized mix of talents needed to bridge science and technology. The work may expand to include modeling, simulation, and the ability to handle big data computing applications and analysis. Beyond that, these people will need to be able to understand the needs of scientists and develop the tools to meet their lab's needs. And this is where session five, the next session, will begin. And that's currently scheduled for, I believe, April 26th. During this session, we've covered a lot of ground, including the ability for multiple labs to use common products and the options for various levels of managing central database on corporate and cloud levels. Vendor hosting cloud systems could provide an easy entry for a small lab into informatics technologies. Care should be taken to ensure that they meet your requirements and that they provide a migration path to corporate and on-premises hosting should that be desirable. There will be a slide following the, this one in the handouts and the PDF that you'll have access to as part of the webinar series. It'll have a list of additional references that'll be useful for the lab's work. That's the end of the formal presentation. Uh, are there any questions people would like to address? Okay. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you can submit your questions or even your comments using the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and do that. While we wait for any questions or comments to come through, um, we, we did receive a few questions um, for Joe that came in that he'd like to address. So we'll go ahead and address those questions and we'll give you a few moments if you do want to go ahead and submit any of your uh, questions or comments. Um, I also want to mention that we will be providing a recording and the slides to everyone um, after the webinar today, it will be posted on the LIMS forum. So I know we did get a few of those uh, questions and comments in the chat box earlier. Okay, so uh, Joe, here's uh, one, of, one of the first few questions here. Uh, you mentioned that the first major component of lab informatics should be the central database system. H how do you protect yourself from making a mistake? Well, the major uh approach to doing that is making sure you've done a thorough job of specifying the system. 
really figure out what it is you need to get done, what you want the system to accomplish, and what model, whether it be the LIMS model or ELN model, fits what your workflow is. You need to talk to people who are knowledgeable in the field um, and look for systems that provide for flexibility. There are a number of them, and the number is increasing, that uh, support both LIMS and ELF, ELN functions. So it might be easier to transition between the two of them. But the real one, the real kicker, is making sure you do a really good analysis and evaluation of what it is you need to get accomplished and how your lab wants to work. OK, great. And um, here is another question that uh, we received. What if IT support people are pushing for a system based on their ERP system? Is this a good idea? Um, usually not. We'll be going into this in more detail in webinar five. When we look at more about I, the details of IT support and start looking at some build or buy solutions. Um, IT people that are using enterprise resource planning systems have invested a lot of effort, a lot of time, and a lot of money, and a lot of training to learn how to use those systems. And they may have sold them on the idea that these systems are going to do everything that the company needs to have done. And then the lab people raise their hand. And these a lot of, there's a lot of things in labs that they probably haven't considered. They may try to build a system around an ERP, but that's usually not a good idea. Some people have done it. But the builder buy solution, the builder buy problem, is a significant one. It really needs a lot of thought and a lot of work. Okay, interesting. Great. Uh, there's there's one last question that we received in advance here, and we'll see if any additional questions come through through the chat box. Uh, how realistic is it to want to connect instruments to a remote database system from the lab? All right. You remember, there's a, there is a distinction between the instrument, which provides an analog output, and the computer system. And in many cases, when a salesman sends you and it sells you an instrument, they automatically sell you the computer as if they're the same thing. You don't compute. You don't connect uh, instruments, the analog output, to remote computers. It simply doesn't work. Uh, what you really do is communicate the database structure. Uh, file sharing, for example, between the computer that's attached to the instrument to a remote computer. So often when you talk to a salesman, you know, say, I want to connect this instrument to my limb system or to a remote ELN, what you're really doing is a computer-to-computer -computer connection, not the instrument itself. It's part of the instrument package. Okay, great. Thank you for answering uh, those questions. It does look like we have a couple questions that came in through through the chat window as well. Um, this first one here, uh, it looks like it seems like the question is asking, um, can you provide criteria to consider for remote server hosting? Um, what do you mean by criteria? Um, basically, you, when you're dealing with a remote server you're really dealing with something akin to a time sharing excuse me a time sharing operation where you're sending data to an instrument you're getting or to, to me sending data to a remote database and getting information back it's like like lock like working with a web browser um, so among the things you want to be concerned about are response times uh, response speed how the data is being controlled, uptime on the servers, uh, that kind of thing. Basically ensure that when the server is there, when you need the server to be there, it'll be there working. Um, not quite sure what it is you're trying to get at. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if there's some more um, clarification that's needed, just let us know in the chat box. Uh, hope, but hopefully that answered your question regarding yeah, criteria it, to consider if, for remote server hosting. Yeah. Yeah, if it didn't, on the bottom of the slides is my email address. Just send me a note, and we can talk that way. OK, great. Uh, that's very great or wonderful that you've provided your contact information, Joe, so that if anyone wants to speak with you one-on-one, -on -one, then you can uh, certainly contact Joe, and uh, he's a great resource for that. OK, and it does look like that does answer uh, Nathan's question there. Uh, another question that 
came through is what is the difference between a traditional SDMS and a LIMS that has a module that emulates similar functionality, but is not considered a true SDMS. Uh, an example is provided. A labware doesn't have an SDMS, but says they have similar functionality through a module. Um, well, it's a lot like saying you've got something that looks just like a duck, but it's not quite a duck. Um, they really, they, it's kind of hard to answer that question without knowing what your, your situation is. Um, SDMSs have been around for a while. Waters has a number of them. Uh, matter of fact, Waters was originally provided by a third party and became part of their system. The question really comes down to is what do you need to have done? An SDMS can be looked at as being a very large filing cabinet that can handle a lot of different stuff. Uh, reports, documents, images, instrument data that's sorted by, by project, by instrument type, um, sample types. You can sort things a different, number of different ways. So the easiest way to, or, to look at that, to answer that question, is say, these are the functions I need. These are the facilities that I need. Uh, this is how I want my lab to work. Does, an SDM, does a true SDMS meet those needs? And then when you talk, turn around to a, uh, a LIMS vendor, for example, and look at what they provide, you can say, fine, does your system meet all these needs? Or is there a lot of hacking or a lot of software development that has to be done to get, the get things working? Uh, an SDMS provides a point of uh, connection for a lot of instrumentation a place where a lot of data can get dumped that doesn't fit into a LIMS file structure. And then the parts that do belong in a LIMS file structure can be extracted and move forward. So again, a lot depends on what, what problem you want to solve. Okay, great. Thanks for answering that. And of course, if you do want to talk with Joe, you know, one on one, his email is uh, available on the slides, and we've provided it through our communication emails as well, so you can dig there as well. Um, but it does look like that did address uh, their question, Joe. So thank you. Uh, Joe's email address again is joe.liskowski at gmail.com. It will be in the slides, so you can connect with him after that. Um, I don't see any other questions that are coming through at this point in time. Uh, what we can do is we can uh, start with our closing information. And of course, if any other questions come through, feel free to go ahead and, and submit those. Uh, but it, it looks like we've covered all of those questions. Joe, is there anything else that you would, you would want to cover before we go ahead and uh, wrap up here today? Uh, no, just thank you for your being here. And as I said, the next session we're going to get into more IT, more information about IT support. That tends to be a very important question. We'll be getting a look at the uh, builder buy, and then future sessions will look uh, at instrumentation, instrument data systems, and moving down the line to sample preparation. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Joe. It doesn't look like there's anything else coming through. So I believe that that will conclude our webinar session here today. So thank you so much. And as a reminder, we will be sending a follow-up to everyone registered with a link to the recording as well as the slides. You can locate parts one, two, and three of this webinar series on the LIMS forum, and we'll include that in our follow-up email as well. So we'll see you next time, and thank you so much.